now. Okay. Well, thank you, Nadine. And it is great to be back at the Hewlett Woodmere. Um, we are still under something of lockdown, uh, but it is gradually easing up. Uh, I got my second of my Moderna uh, vaccinations last week, so I'm relatively uh, safe. So, but still, uh, you have to be careful because, I mean, who would have ever imagined that up in Michigan there is a brand new outbreak and countries like France and Brazil, good Lord, I mean. So, best thing is to be safe and um, stick with the Zoom um, lectures. In fact, I just got an announcement from Toro College, where you know I teach. And our classes in September are all going to be again on Zoom because it is so dangerous to have gangs of people, teachers and students uh, congregating on campus. So it's going to be Zoom for some time into the future. Ron, do you want to talk about the lectures that we're booking? Yes. In fact, we are going to be continuing um our um series now this has been a series as nadine said on um various religions of the world the origins hinduism judaism confucianism and today buddhism and what we decided to do was to change a little bit uh, and beginning in july july 13th we're going to be doing a series on the ancient cities of the world and uh, on July 13th, we will be doing Angkor Wat, the great, wonderful city in Cambodia, the abandoned city, which at one time was one of the largest cities in the world. And then in September, we'll be doing the fabled city of Petra, which is in Jordan, where Saudi Arabia, Israel, and Jordan intersect, which it also was at one time a great city of the ancient world, which is today largely forgotten, except for people like me and a few others who just uh, uh, love to explore the world. So we'll have a new um, series on the ancient cities of the world, beginning with uh, Angkor Wat and Petra, and then we will continue uh, into the fall season. So. We'll be doing some armchair traveling because who knows what's going to be happening in the future. I'm still holding my month of August free so that I can go to Europe and see all my friends. But once again, who knows what the travel situation is going to be. So we'll be doing a series on the ancient cities of the world. So an armchair traveling. Well, today our topic is, in keeping with the great religions of the world, is Buddhism, one of the uh, most interesting world religions. And in fact, uh, with Nadine and Claire and some others, we were talking uh, that everybody seemed to have a statue of the Buddha uh, in, their, uh, in their homes. Uh, if you can see, Nadine has a statue of the Buddha behind her, the fat laughing Buddha. Claire had one with a had Buddha surrounded by children. The picture you see on the screen is the meditating Buddha. I have here one that I inherited from my mother, which is a little incense bowl for burning incense sticks. Now, I grew up on a farm, so the odors on a farm uh, are of animal droppings and slaughtered chickens and cut grass and hay. And so my mother was always burning little incense sticks in her Buddha statue. So every statue is very different. And when you have a statue of the Buddha, the first thing you should look at are the hands. Now, if you look at the picture on the screen right in front of me, you see the hands are parallel. The hand position in uh, Buddhist uh, art is called the mudra. 
And the mudra tells you what the statue is about. So the statue we see on the picture here is the mudra, the hands parallel, the eyes closed. This is the meditating Buddha. It is not the laughing, welcoming Buddha. It is not the teaching Buddha. This is the meditating Buddha. So there's a whole art and a whole science, you could say, around the statue of the Buddha. You have the fat Buddha. You have the skinny Buddha, the Buddha who was fasting. You have the Buddha who was climbing mountains on pilgrimages, the slim Buddha with his legs exposed climbing the mountains. So every statue is really a theology in stone, which is really quite fascinating. So uh, you can find out where your statue fits into the thousands of images of the Buddha, each depicting him in a different uh, pose, in a different function. So once again, uh, this is the outline. We're going to be talking about the origins of uh, Buddhism, like Christianity, which emerged from Judaism like Hinduism, which emerged from the Indus Valley civilization, Buddhism has religious roots. It is rooted in Hinduism. And then we'll talk about the otherworldly aspect of Buddhism, the seeker, the culmination of his teachings, the Four Noble Truths, the establishment of the first great Buddhist empire in India under Ashoka the Great, and then the two main branches of Buddhism. Like Christianity, you have the Orthodox Church, the Protestants, the Catholics, and everybody else. And like Judaism, you have Hasidism, you have Orthodoxy, Reform, Conservative, so with Buddhism, you have many different branches. The two most important are the Theravada of Southeast Asia and the Mahayana Buddhism of China, Korea, and um, Japan. So now, once again, uh, if you look at the toolbar at the top of your screen, you'll see at the far right there are those little dots. And usually it says something like more. And there at the top is the chat function. So if you have questions or comments, uh, feel free to type them in. And when I'm finished in about 45 minutes, I will then uh, um, uh, open up the chat line and take any questions you have. And then we will unmute everybody and you can unmute yourself and we will um, have a discussion. Okay, now. The very important thing to distinguish in world religions, whether it's Judaism or Hinduism or Confucianism or Protestantism, is that some religions are this worldly and other religions are otherworldly. For example, Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, and Confucianism are what we call this worldly religion meaning the religion tells you how to live your life here on earth. Very strict rules. Judaism tells you what you can eat, what you can't eat, when you should fast, what kind of clothes you should wear, when you should go to synagogue, when you should pray. Islam, the same thing, you have halal food, what is the holiday? In fact, today, as I speak, we're beginning the holiday of Ramadan, which is obligatory on all Muslims. Confucianism, Hinduism are all this worldly. How to do business, how to get a divorce, how to raise children. They have sacred languages, whether it's Hebrew or Sanskrit or Arabic. They have a sacred language. Whereas Christianity and Buddhism are of a very different category. They are otherworldly. Catholics can eat anything. I mean, you can eat pork, you can have a hamburger, you can mix meat and milk. Uh, Jesus didn't waste his time telling us what to wear, what to eat, 
what to celebrate. There are no holy lands in Christianity. You can wear anything you want to. And Buddhism is the same thing. It is a very totally otherworldly religion. And so this is a main distinction in religion. So Buddhism is a, might call it a mystical religion, a purely spiritual religion, not concerned with the things of this world. Now, where did Buddhism come from? Well, Buddhism emerged from the more ancient religion, which was Hinduism. Hinduism emerged in what is today the borderline between Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India along the Indus Valley. Hinduism is the oldest continuing existing religion in the world going back 3,000 years BC, BCE. And we know very little about it except that it was as you can see, along the Indus River, and water was important. On the left, you see the great bathing or ritual pools of the Harappa Indus Valley civilization. So they had very were a washing a water civilization. And this is where Hinduism emerged. Hinduism had many gods. It was really not even considered a religion, but it was considered a plethora of other religions. We don't know much about the Indus Valley civilization because they had so little left behind other than archeological ruins. They didn't have writing, uh, but the little bit of writing inscriptions that we have, uh, we can't interpret. Uh, we know very little about it. But these were the roots of Buddhism, going back into the Indus Valley civilization. Now, the Indus Valley civilization was a hierarchical civilization. This is where the Hindus had the caste system. The priests were at the top, the Brahmins. Any Hindu temple you go to today, the priests are going to be born into the priestly caste. Similar to Judaism, where you had the Cohens and the Levites who were the caste, the class of priests. So you couldn't go to a seminary in the Hindu world, study and be ordained a priest. You had to be born into a priestly family. The next level were the warriors and the rulers. This was the caste of the Buddha. His father was a king. He was raised to inherit his father's throne, which he did. And then underneath you have the Vaishyas, the skilled traders and merchants, the Sudras, the unskilled workers. And at the very bottom, you had the outcasts, the untouchables, the children of God. Now we talked a lot about this. When was that? Seems a long time ago. On February 23rd, when we talked about the enduring power of the caste system, you were born to your destiny. You couldn't become a warrior or a ruler or a priest unless you were born into that caste. So the Indus Valley civilization and Hinduism was a very rigid society and the caste system still exists to today. In fact, a very good friend of mine, I mentioned uh, when we spoke about Hinduism, uh, who went to Harvard with me, she was of the Brahmin caste. And she kept saying, oh, the Brahmins, that's all old fashioned, the caste system, that's old fashioned. But I'll tell you, every one of her friends who I met at Harvard were of the Brahmin caste, meaning it is still very, very deeply rooted in Indian society. The Buddha also grew up worshiping a plethora of gods. You go to a Hindu temple, such as the Ganesha temple in Flushing, Every corner has a shrine to a different god. If you are a woman hoping to get pregnant and having great difficulty, 
you pray to the goddess of fertility. If you already have eight kids and you want to stop getting pregnant, you pray to another god who teaches infertility. Go in one corner and you see students studying in front of the statue of the god of intellectual pursuits. You're a businessman, you go to Ganesha who removes obstacles and you invoke Ganesha to help your new business be prosperous. And so there's no one God fits all, but everybody finds a God that suits their particular goals. Hinduism ruled every aspect of life. When you go to India today, you can see who is a person of the priestly caste by the clothes they wear, the temple they go to, the school they attend, the neighborhood they live in. Every member of the Hindu society has its god or its gods, Certain foods are forbidden for one caste, but permitted for another. Marriage is regulated by your caste. You study the sacred language of Sanskrit. So Hinduism was a very this-worldly religion, regulating every aspect of your daily life. Very similar to Orthodox Judaism, to strict Islam, to Confucianism. And this is precisely what the Buddha rejected. He said, I do know, I no longer accept all of these rules regulating daily life. I reject this, this list of thousands of gods. I reject the caste system. So the Buddha rejected his Hindu background, and he be established a new religion, which was strongly anti-Hindu, rejecting the rules of food and clothing and caste and jobs, and created a religion which dealt only with spiritual matters. Now, the Buddhist world today is seen on this map. There are two main forms of Judaism, which we'll be talking about. The yellow, which is China, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam, are the Mahayana Buddhists. The red areas are Burma, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Sri Lanka. This is the Theravada Buddhism. There's another branch, which is the Tibetan Buddhism, which we do know a lot about, and Mongolian Buddhism. And so we see that Buddhism, like every other religion, splits and adapts to a particular society, just like it was the Germans who became Lutheran, just like it was the Scots who became Presbyterians, just like it was the Irish who became Catholic and the Russians who became Orthodox Christian. So Buddhism also divided into various teachings. Now, Buddhism is one of those religions which has a founder. Hinduism does not have a founder. It just emerged over the centuries. But Judaism has its two founders, Abraham and Moses, who we know a lot about, who left writings behind them. We know about Jesus, founder of Christianity. We know a lot about Muhammad, who was the founder of Islam. Well, we know a lot about Siddhartha Gautama, who lived in the year 563 to 483 BC or BCE. We know he was born into the Kshatriya or the ruling caste. He was born in what is today the borderline between Nepal and India up in the mountains. His father was a king. He was raised to inherit his father's position. 
So he was born into a strict Hindu family. Now, he didn't reject Hinduism as a religion, but he went beyond Hinduism. So throughout his life, he considered himself a good Hindu, but he simply went beyond Hinduism, just like Jesus considered himself a good Jew until the end, but he considered himself going beyond Judaism, accomplishing Judaism. So as a son of a king, he got married. See the famous pictures of him sitting on the throne beside his queen. They had a son, which was his duty as a member of the Kshatriya caste to get married, produce an heir, a son, and he remained a king for 29 years. So he considered himself a good Hindu. He, he did everything required of his role as a member of the Hindu Kshatriya caste. But then there arose a crisis. He kept saying, I'm locked up here in the castle. I'm protected and I'm pampered. But when he would look out through the windows of his palace, he would see there's a world out there. And so he started sneaking out of the castle at night and exploring this very mysterious world. He discovered three things. The first trip, he saw a very old man sitting on the street. His teeth were falling out, his hair was gone, his muscles were withered. And he asked, he said, what happened to you? And the man said, I am an old man. And this is what happens to old people. So the Buddha discovered age. The next time he discovered a woman who was afflicted with leprosy, sores, and said, what happened to you? And she said, this is called disease. Viruses come in and they afflict the body. Well, the third time out, he saw a dead body lying in the street and went up to the person and said, what happened to you? Well, of course, the person couldn't answer. And the people said, this is death. This is what happens to every person. So the Buddha was so impressed by this strange world that he had never encountered, he had been protected from, that he decided one day to leave the castle. He had produced an heir to the throne, and this was called the Great Departure very commonly depicted in Buddhist art, such as the carvings on the left show him on his horse, leaving the castle, going out and discovering the mystery of life and death. Even you see the picture on the right, a Chinese movie depicting again the legend of the great departure, where the Buddha went out to discover the meaning of life. Now, this is very common in world religions where the leader rejects his past and goes off to discover the meaning of life. Think of the Hebrews wandering for 40 years in the Sinai desert, forging a people, forging a nation under the leadership of Moses, getting laws, getting rituals, getting the priesthood. Jesus going into the desert where he was tempted by the devil. Or Joseph Smith, the leader of the Mormons, fleeing under Brigham Young, upstate New York and the East, and journeying across the country to Salt Lake City. This is a common building block of every religion, rejecting the past and searching for the true meaning of the world. 
very common in Buddhist art is cutting his hair. Hair is a very important building block, whether you have Orthodox Jewish women covering their hair, Catholic nuns cutting off their hair, whether it is men and Sikh religion, never cutting their hair in their whole life, or whether they are Catholic monks in monasteries shaving their hair. Hair, as we know from the Jewish Bible, is a symbol of power. It is a symbol of sexuality among women. So when the Buddha shaved his hair, he was rejecting his past, rejecting power, rejecting this world, and embarking on the search for meaning. Now here again, we see two aspects of the Buddha. One, we see the skeletal Buddha. I don't know if anybody has a statue of the Buddha in skin and bones, but during his six years of searching, he explored every religion that he could find. One religion believed in fasting. So he would fast to control the body. This is depicted in the statues of the Buddha, the Buddha in skin and bone. He prayed to various gods. Here you see another statue with his hands in the sign of prayer, worshiping, studying, imploring all of the gods of the ancient world. Finally, after six years of searching, he was sitting under a tree in a town called Bodhgaya, which is in Bihar province in um, the northeast of India, a place where I spent an absolutely wonderful vacation a number of years ago. He was sitting under the tree and he achieved enlightenment. Enlightenment in Buddhism means I now understand what the world is about. I understand what human life should be like. Today, Bodh Gaya, you can see it on the map on the right. If you look right, almost in the middle of the picture, you see that little blue arrow pointing up to Bodh Gaya. Bodh is the Hindu Sanskrit word for the Buddha. Gaya is a nearby town. And the tree at the top of the picture is the Pipal tree, not the actual tree, but it is a descendant of the original tree. The seeds are taken by people and planted, and this one is probably one of the great, great, great grandchildren of the original tree under which the Buddha sat. And Bodh Gaya has become the sacred city of Buddhism. Even though Buddhism hardly flourished in India, still in Bodh Gaya, you have temples and monasteries and entire sections of the town supported by Buddhists from various countries as the largest statue of the meditating Buddha. See the hands parallel again, like in the very first picture, the Buddha meditating. So it's a magnificent little town uh, completely filled with monks from every country in the world, nuns from every country in the world wearing their distinctive colored robes. Now, the central teaching of Buddhism is life means suffering. Our lives are basically unhappy. Now, the question is, why are we constantly unhappy? Well, the second noble truth is we are attached to transient things. We want more money. We want more education. We want a bigger house. We want more tea sets to add to our collection. 
We want to have a more beautiful body. We want another facelift or tummy tuck or Botox treatment because we lust after transient material things. We want wealth. We want political power. We want fame. We want glory. We want our book to be recognized by the New York Times book reviews as the New York Times book of the year. So we are slaves to goals in this world. Well, the Buddha taught that we can escape from this cycle of wanting, of desire. And the fourth part was his complex eightfold path to liberating ourselves from the desire of material things. To say, I don't really need a brand new house. I don't need another car. I am not attached to fame or power or glory because the more money you want, the more greedy you get and you are never satisfied. Would Bernie Madoff ever have achieved a point of financial satisfaction? Would a dictator of some foreign country ever get enough political power. Well, the Buddha gave, taught the way of transcending all of these worldly things. And so the Buddha taught that life is suffering. The very moment we are born, we enter into the struggle for life, overcoming disease, growing, Old age afflicts us, sickness eventually death. We suffer when we can't get what we want and we suffer when we can't get enough of what we want. And so he argued, we are attached to youth, to health, to life. We want power in the status quo. We want material objects that human life is constant obsession with material beings and that we can overcome them. Now, this is important, the third step. We ourselves can overcome suffering and we don't need a God to help us. There's no God coming down and giving us laws as he gave to Moses. There's no God coming down and creating humans as he did Adam and Eve. Humans can achieve enlightenment by our own power. So Buddhism has no God. Buddha taught we ourselves are capable of achieving liberation from all of the things that we aspire to. So there is no God in Buddhism. There is no need for God. It was a religion which empowered the individual. You yourself can achieve liberation, perfect happiness, and enlightenment. Now here's the eight noble path. Um, here again, books have been written on it. It is your psychological, how you view the world, what are your intentions, regulating the correct speech, correct action, livelihood, effort, concentration, mindfulness. Each of these are very important steps in achieving what the Buddha defined as nirvana. Now, we've heard a lot of times the word nirvana. It is spiritual liberation. Now, in a Buddhist temple and in Buddhist artwork, you see very often pictures such as the one on the left showing the path that the individual must follow 
to gradually liberate himself or herself from all of the attachment to worldly things. And suddenly when you get to the point where you no longer aspire to political power, you no longer aspire to glory, you no longer aspire to a bigger house or more wealth or more children or more glory or more physical power, then you achieve liberation and you are totally free. And this is what is called nirvana. Now, as the picture implies, this is a difficult path. Very few people accomplish it. It is a constant striving of a lifetime until finally you escape and you are totally free. Now, very controversial in Buddhism is even the concept of me as an individual is an impediment to achieving nirvana. Now, sometimes they, people translate nirvana as heaven or spiritual happiness. Well, in both Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, and the origin of the monotheistic religions, um, the um, Persian Zoroastrianism, in all of these monotheistic religions, the individual, me and you, will hopefully one day be in heaven. I will be up there. And the Christian Bible, Jewish Bible is very clear. You yourself will be in heaven. You will be, as Christians say, living in a mansion seated beside God. Whereas Buddhism says even the idea of me as a separate individual from other individuals is an impediment to spiritual liberation. I will cease to exist. There will be no longer me, but I will be part of the forces of nature. Which is one of the reasons why Buddhism is not that popular these days as a growing religion, because everybody wants to be in heaven himself or herself. We are so attached to our individual identity that we can't conceive of transcending it and achieving liberation from the consciousness of me. So the goal of Buddhism is liberation from everything. There is no pilgrimage to a holy land. There are no chosen people, holy cities. Uh, Buddhism does not regulate what you should eat or wear, where you are in the caste system. Buddhism does not even stress marriage and producing children and leaving an inheritance to children. Buddhism has nothing to do with government and rulers. Even wealth, success, and the self are obstacles to enlightenment. Well, the Buddha achieved enlightenment, and then he died and ceased to exist. Well, his teaching is Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path began to attract large numbers of followers in India. In fact, one of the greatest kings of ancient India who ruled in the 300s and 200s BC, BCE, adopted Buddhism as the official religion of his great Mauryan empire which included Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, spreading up to the Himalaya mountains. And this dynasty of Ashoka the Great spread the teachings of Buddha from Bodhgaya, which you see on the map, up to Sarnath, where the Buddha gave his first sermon, Mathura, one of the great cities, Buddhist cities of India, spreading Buddhism down into southern India. And this great Buddhist empire 
became one of the great ancient empires of the world. And Buddhism spread. Ashoka sent missionaries teaching the new religion. Some say that they went even as far as Persia and the Middle East. The first missionaries crossed over through Afghanistan and across the Himalaya mountains into China and Japan and Korea, down into Indonesia and Malaysia. And Buddhism, the teachings of the Buddha spread throughout Asia. In fact, there are some stories that say that even Jesus was influenced by Buddhist missionaries. And that's where Jesus got a lot of his ideas of being an otherworldly religion. Well, every religion, as it spreads, it enculturates into a culture. Judaism. When it got to Eastern Europe, it established the Orthodox Judaism, Hasidic Judaism, um, and the various clothing traditions evolved its own language of Yiddish. Judaism in Spain became Sephardic with their own way of worshiping, their own minhag, their own sacred language of Ladino. Christianity spread from the land of Israel into Russia, where you get Russian Christian architecture, to Rome, to Ethiopia, up into Germany, where it became Protestantism. Islam spread out of Saudi Arabia, and it became Egyptian in Egypt, Babylonian in Babylon. Here we see the mosque in Senegal and Chad and Niger, typically African Islam. So as Buddhism spread, it adapted to different cultures, just like Judaism adapted. You had Reform Judaism in Germany and the United States, Orthodox Judaism, Russian Orthodox Christianity, Ethiopian Christianity, Shiite Islam in Iran. You had Sunni Islam. You had African Murid Islam. So Buddhism adapted to each individual culture. Today, one of the largest and most powerful forms of Buddhism is what we call Theravada Buddhism. And this flourished in, if you look at the map, it is the official Buddhism of Sri Lanka, down below India. Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Burma, Tibet, up in the mountains, and Mongolia. Is this form of Theravada Buddhism has its own distinctive architecture, as you can see in the style. And it became the official Buddhism of these countries. For example, Thailand. The official religion of Thailand is Buddhism. The official religion of Myanmar or Burma is Buddhism. Now, as state religion, it became an instrument of government power. The kings and presidents and dictators are formally Buddhists. So when Burma is expelling the Rohingya Muslims, on their baseball hats in Burma, they say, make Burma Buddhist again. And so this is state Buddhism. Now, once again, it doesn't sound like something the Buddha would have approved of, but religions, once they are founded and the founder dies, religions tend to go their own way. These are the most militant of Buddhisms today, where the government is Buddhist. Buddhism is the state religion, sort of like Islam is the state religion of Iran. Judaism is the state religion of Israel. Evangelical Protestants want to make America an evangelical Protestant country. So this is one form of state Buddhism, which is very powerful today. 
It is the Tibetan Buddhism. We know the Dalai Lama, who is not just the spiritual leader of Burma, but he is also the political leader. He is the king and he is the pope rolled up into one. And so in Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Laos, Burma, Thailand, Tibet, and Mongolia, these are officially Buddhist countries. Severe restrictions on non-Buddhists. The king or the dictator or the ruler is a strict Buddhist. The Buddhist monks have great power. The government builds and supports Buddhist temples in each of these countries. The most famous form of state Buddhism is, of course, Tibetan Buddhism, where the Dalai Lama is both a Buddhist monk, and he is the king of the country. Another country which has state Buddhism is Burma. And this is becoming a major issue in world politics today, where Burma says we are a Buddhist country, all Muslims, all Christians, all Jews, all Sikhs, all Jains either convert to the official Buddhism or get out. And so you have a religious warfare going on in these countries. Picture on the right, Buddhist warfare where you see Buddhist monks taking military training and they are turning the uh, Theravada countries of Cambodia and Laos and Thailand into Buddhist countries. A couple of years ago, I was in Southern Thailand. Thailand is predominantly Buddhist and it is state Buddhism. But in the South, there are large numbers of Muslims. And so what is the government doing? It's saying, become a Buddhist or get out. They go into a totally Muslim town. They take over the town square and they are putting up giant statues of the Buddha to show that Thailand is a Buddhist country. Now this is, as I mentioned, happening everywhere where Israel is a Jewish country, Iran is a Shiite country, India is becoming more and more a Hindu country. And when I was in India, I saw the persecution of the Christians in Goa and Mumbai, and I saw protests such as the one on the right, where people were saying India should be a country with freedom of religion, not a Hindu country. Well, the same thing is happening in many of the Buddhist countries where they say Buddhism is now the official state religion. There is another popular form of Buddhism, and this is the Mahayana Buddhism. This is not state Buddhism. This is, in my opinion, closer to what the Buddha taught pure spiritual Buddhism. China is not a Buddhist state. China is a Confucianist country. The official religion of China is Confucian. When we talked about Confucianism the last talk, we talked about how the society is structured according to the Confucian principles. So Buddhism, when it arrived in China, it found that the state was already functioning. Confucius was the religion of China. And so Buddhism remained totally otherworldly. And the countries such as China and such as we're going to see Japan and Korea and Vietnam developed two basic religious systems. In China and in Vietnam, 
Korea and uh, Japan, the government is run according to Confucius principles. Confucius taught about the importance of the king, the caste system with the peasants at the bottom, loyalty to the emperor. Government was regulated by Confucianism, the state religion of China. Well, Buddhism was sort of left out of the system. And the Buddhist monks in China said, sure, let the Confucianists run the government. Our concern is achieving enlightenment. So in China, the Buddhists built magnificent temples out in the forests at the top of mountains where people could withdraw from society meditate, purify themselves, and become totally spiritual. So Confucianism was political religion. Buddhism in China, Vietnam, Korea, and Japan became pure spiritual religion. Mahayana Buddhism flourished in China, where the majority of the people are Mahayana, as well as Vietnam. Korea, and Japan. So you had two forms of Buddhism, the purely spiritual Buddhism, as was taught by the Buddha, which flourished in China, Vietnam, Korea, and Japan, and the Theravada, or political Judaism, or political uh, Buddhism of South Asia, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Burma, and Sri Lanka. This is the militant Buddhism where the Buddhist monks take up submachine guns and expel Muslims, expel Christians and expel other people and rule the country. Whereas in China, the Buddhists are peaceful, mystical, withdrawing up into mountains to meditate. And so in China and Japan, Korea and Vietnam, Buddhist temples are islands of tranquility in a very busy and confusing world. Young men and young women go to the monasteries where they meditate. And even the Buddha is venerated as a great leader. Now, the Buddha, even in China, is not considered a god, although you would think Sometimes that people treated him as a god, burning incense and prayers and all of that, but they are hopefully using the Buddha as their source of inspiration. Now, in many Buddhist temples, such as the one on the right, you will see the Buddha having achieved enlightenment, but surrounded by the different stages of the Buddha's spiritual journey. If you look closely at the Buddha, you can't see it too well, but you'll see the Buddha's one hand is in front of him, horizontal. The other hand is over his leg and touching the platform on which he is seated. This is called the mudra. And this is one of his teaching positions. He's not meditating with his eyes closed. His eyes are open. One hand is meditating, but the other hand is touching the ground, saying, come to me, students, and I will teach you the path to enlightenment. So Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese, and Korean Buddhism is a very spiritual form of Judaism not at all involved in politics. Politics is considered an impediment to enlightenment. Stay away from it. The most spiritual form of Mahayana Buddhism is commonly known in the West as Zen Buddhism. The Zen Buddhist monasteries are, such as the one on the right, isolated from the world withdraw from the world, go up to the top of a mountain, 
Remove yourself from airplanes and cell phones and businesses and banks and stores and politics and withdraw into pure spirituality. And this is the type of Buddhism which has spread widely in the West. Now, I'm sure some of you are uh, of the age group that you remember back in the 60s and 70s, where everybody was leaving New York or Long Island and going to an ashram or going to a Zen Buddhist monastery and escaping from the confusion of this world. In fact, there was a whole literature of Zen Buddhism. Remember the famous book by Robert uh, Pirsag, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, the Zen Doctrine of No Mind of Suzuki. This was the Buddhism which really spread into the United States. This is the first big expansion of Buddhism outside of Asia. And this was during the 60s when many Japanese and Chinese and Vietnamese Buddhist monks came to the United States and they offered this pure spiritual Zen Buddhism as an escape from the chaos of this world. Well, Buddhism continued to influence the, uh, the world not just by Zen Buddhist missionaries, but by migration. Picture on the left, you see the Mahayana Chinese Buddhist temple, which is on Canal Street in uh, Chinatown on the border between where the Bowery, uh, the Lower East Side and Chinatown meet. This has the largest statue of the Buddha, uh, they claim, um, in the United States inside of a, uh, of a temple. Well, it's not just Chinese and, Vietnam and uh, Japanese Buddhism, which is spread to the United States, either by missionaries or by migration. Picture on the right is a uh, Bo uh, Buddhist temple from Thailand. You see the distinctive Thai um, architecture. Uh, this one is in Queens, a couple of blocks from uh, Jackson Heights, uh, right near where I live. And so large numbers of Buddhists have migrated to the West. Largest number is by far the Chinese and the Korean, but also Thai, Burmese, large numbers of Vietnamese Buddhists. Now, the Buddhist temples in the United States are still ethnically divided. Just like at one time you'd have a Polish Catholic Church, an Italian Catholic Church, a German Catholic Church, and an Irish Catholic Church. But today through intermarriage, you just have sort of a generic American Catholic Church. Well, the same thing is happening with Buddhism. As more and more Buddhists are intermarrying, uh, my best friend in uh, uh, New York, he is Chinese Buddhist. His wife is Vietnamese Buddhist, and they send the kids to a Buddhist meditation center on Saturdays uh, where they learn the Buddhist culture, and then they go to public school. But they consider themselves American Buddhists, a new form of Buddhism, which is going to be the merging of the various Buddhist schools. Now, in addition to migration of Buddhists and Buddhist missionaries, Buddhism has also become a major tourist destination. And you have tourist groups that organize visits to Sarnath and Gaya in India, the sacred cities of the Buddha. You have in Nepal and up in the mountains, uh, tourist groups and young uh, hippie types visiting the Hindu, uh, the Buddhist temples. You have uh, uh, temples all over India and Sri Lanka and Vietnam. Nepal up in the mountains has become a major pilgrimage site 
where the young and the curious go. Sometimes we'll spend a year or two meditating in a Buddhist monastery. So Buddhism is one of the great religions of the world, and it is struggling, like most religions today, to maintain their identity, to withstand the onslaught of missionaries. Today is a great religious competition. Islam is expanding into South Asia. Evangelical and Christian missionaries are going into China and introducing Christianity. And so Buddhism is forced to become competitive in a world of conflicting religions. I always refer to Samuel P. Huntington's book on the clash of civilizations, where he said one of the main, if not the main characteristic of the 21st century is going to be vicious religious competition about which religion is going to dominate the 21st century. Will Buddhism emerge as a major contestant? Will evangelical Christians take over? Uh, will militant Islam take over? A lot is going on in this competition for the 21st century. So that brings us to an end of this whirlwind tour of another one of the great world religions. And I encourage you, if you get a chance and you see a Buddhist temple, stop in. I mean, my philosophy is if the door is open and people are going in and out, go in. If they don't want you, they'll kick you out. If but most Buddhists, as most people in general, are eager to introduce their particular religious group to new visitors.